Welcome and thank you very much for joining us on episode 140 of the Blazer's Edge podcast presented to you today by blazersedge.com. I'm your weekend host, Chris Lucia. And I'm your weekend co-host, Brandon Goldner. If you want to get in touch with the Blazer's Edge weekend podcast, you can always hit us up at blazersedgepodcast at gmail.com. And we'd also love if you gave us your reviews, ratings, and subscriptions on Stitcher, iTunes, and YouTube. Uh, You really have no idea how much those mean to us, especially the ratings and reviews. Um, Whether you think we're doing a great job or a terrible job, we would love to hear from you. So please hit us up any way that you can. So this week on the Blazer's Edge Weekend Podcast is going to be uh, just co-host Brandon Goldner and I. We have a handful of questions that we solicited from Twitter and Facebook. So thank you for all the readers uh, for sending those in. We're going to get to those on the show this week. So Brandon, how's it going, man? Pretty good, Chris. Thanks for having me here again. Definitely happy to be here looking out on a kind of a gray and cloudy Friday afternoon. Got a little rumbly in my tummy, but I'm going to power through it for this podcast and get to those reader questions uh so yeah definitely stoked to be here for sure yeah, thanks man we appreciate it and i think the big story that we probably shouldn't go any further without mentioning right is damian lillard uh second team all nba that that's pretty huge yeah for sure dame dalla getting not only all nba but getting second team all nba as our listeners probably know damian lillard was selected to all nba third team a couple years ago, um, selected the second team this year, and definitely a huge honor for Damian Lillard and for the team itself, I would say. Yeah, definitely pretty crazy, too, thinking about back in February, you know, we were we were talking about how he could potentially be you know, one of the last additions to the All-Star roster, and he ended up not you know, making the All-Star team. And all of a sudden now, uh, you know, come the end of May, he's second team All-NBA. Yeah, for sure. And that's part of the narrative, isn't it, that we see from Blazers fans where it's like, yeah, Damian Lillard got second team all NBA. Oh, but he's not an all star. Right. So there's a little bit of that sentiment going around Portland. I'm sure that, you know, Damian Lillard himself is a player who feeds off of people not believing in him. I mean, I'd go back to that that uh, p- photo of him kind of on the weight machine with the never doubt me shirt. So definitely that's something that that pushes him forward or people necessarily not believing in him but yeah for sure i mean it's crazy i i was i don't know what you thought but i was definitely of the mind that he would make third team i didn't see second team in the cards how did you feel about that i was absolutely surprised by the second team uh it was mostly based on the fact that uh, he was kind of left off the all-star team and i thought well if that was the sentiment just three months ago then could it change enough that he would be considered one of the top four guards in the NBA? Well, let me let me ask you something. Do you feel like that maybe this is like a makeup vote? Do you have any sense that like, and I know that the the folks responsible for voting, just for our listeners, they probably know this too, the folks are f- responsible for voting for the all-star team are going to be the fans and then the coaches, whereas the folks responsible for all NBA are members of the media. But despite that, do you feel like maybe this is like kind of like a makeup call that he didn't make the all-star team so people were maybe more inclined to vote for him for the all NBA team? Well, the voting, so the voting comes later on, you know, obviously three months after, or not, not quite three months after the all-star game. I think it's, I think it's at the, at the end of the regular season, they submit their votes for the all NBA teams. So, you know, you have, I think it's, what 20 is probably about 30 games or so after the all-star break and so you have this is where you see things fall into place for other teams and other players as well and you saw the blazers on an upward trajectory after the all-star game and a couple of other guys that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit once we address some of these reader questions you know you saw their teams on a downward trajectory so it kind of opened up a, a slot you know for a guy like damian lillard to get up there uh, in the second team so you know, speaking of the, those reader questions, I don't, I don't want to get into this too much because we have some concerning uh, the All NBA team. So, Brandon, why don't, why don't you go ahead and give us that first reader question there? Yeah, for sure. This question comes from frequent reader and listener uh, Mason Leonard. 
Shout out Mason Leonard. I see I see him all the time on the Twitter. Yeah, I, I see him too. His his handle is at Aus2PDX, and he has got his Avi is off the chain. It's literally a Photoshop that combines uh, Mason Pumley and Myers Leonard's face into one. It's anyway, you should check it out. So also <laughs> us to uh, PDX. That that would be most likely an Australian listener, I would assume. So uh Mason Leonard, if you're if you're listening and you're listening from Australia, I want to say uh, thank you. Shout out to all the international listeners of the Blazers Edge podcast. We really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And I think he also frequents the site too. So um Mason Leonard, uh you to MVP. And he <laughs> asks uh, what do we think of the all NBA teams? Do we agree with the list and what would we change in it? So Chris and I have in front of us the full and complete list of 2015, 16, all NBA voting for first, second and third team, including honorable mentions. So Chris, what on this list jumps out at you? Who do you think is the biggest surprise on this list? And who do you think is the biggest snub? So, so for the listeners who don't have the list in front of them, I'm assuming that's the majority of them. Uh, let me just really quickly go over uh, the players that made the team. So the first team uh, is LeBron, uh, Kawhi, DeAndre Jordan, Steph Curry, Russell Westbrook. Uh, second team is Kevin Durant, Draymond Green, DeMarcus Cousins, Chris Paul, and Dame. Third team is Paul George, uh, LaMarcus Aldridge, Andre Drummond, Clay Thompson, uh, Kyle Lowry. So... Those are your 15 All-NBA selections for 2015, 2016. So what jumps out on the list to me? I personally, and, and this isn't, I, I, I don't think this is, is proximity bias. I think that a lot of people are probably going to be surprised by that Damian Lillard second team vote. Uh, making it uh, on, on the second team, like we mentioned after not making the All-Star team, uh, that, that's got to be pretty surprising for a lot of fans. Yeah, for sure. And just to say real quick that Damian Lillard is the only player on the second team that did not receive a single vote for first team. So he picked up all of his points from his second and third team uh, nods. But it's it's probably worth mentioning that there were only three guards in the NBA who actually received first team votes. Uh, Steph Curry received all 129 of the ones he was eligible for. Well deserved. Uh, Russell Westbrook got 120 of those and, and, and then nine second team votes. Uh, and then Chris Paul in a, in a very distant third got eight first team votes and then no other guard got first team votes uh, besides uh, those three guys. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not surprising that Dame wouldn't be getting any first team votes considering, you know, Steph Curry and Russ Westbrook being such locks for that and then Chris Paul sneaking in there and getting a few of those. I think that's kind of the upper echelon, the most, you know, the elite of the elite point guards uh, slash guards in the NBA. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I also think, as you were just kind of describing, that part of the reason why the votes cut the way they did is because all NBA is limited by position. So you get to vote for two forwards, two guards, and one center. So you have some odd fits, right, where Draymond Green is listed as forward, but he often plays, you know, a little bit of center. Um, you have, you know, like Damian Lillard making second team um, and some other kind of, you know, you might say that a player like James Harden would deserve to get in uh, over some of these other players on the third team. But yeah, so that voting is limited by the fact that you have to vote for two guards, two forwards, and one center. And then not, you mentioned the, the centers there, and th this is actually kind of interesting as I'm looking uh, on this list here because DeAndre Jordan on the first team there, of all the guys who are on the first team, okay, let me list off the amount of first team votes that they got. So LeBron James, 125 out of 129. Kawhi Leonard, 94. Steph Curry, all 129. Russ Westbrook got all one, uh, 120 out of 129. DeAndre Jordan comes in with 39 of the 129 potential first team votes. Okay, so for the second team, DeMarcus Cousins had 32 of those first team votes. Uh, and then on the third team, you had Andre Drummond uh, at center with 13 first team votes, which was actually uh, the most of any third teamer uh, receiving votes for the first team. The only other third teamer who received any first team votes was LaMarcus Aldridge with three. So Drummond getting 13 of those and DeMarcus on the second team getting 32 first team votes and DeAndre getting only 39 and, and actually making the, the first team, that shows to me how, how crazy neck and neck this was apparently uh, to pick 
that first team center. And, and it's kind of interesting to me that a guy like Hassan Whiteside, after the, the season he had, uh, in terms of his field goal percentage and the amount of blocks per game that he got, the last uh, player to do that, I believe, was I think it was 60% plus shooting on the offensive end and three and three quarters blocks on the defensive end. I think the last guy to do that, if I'm not mistaken, was Alonzo Mourning in the late 90s. So that's you know that's that's a pretty solid year for a center, especially a guy you know like Hassan Whiteside, who in the past has had his share of issues. For sure, and just to say that uh, Hassan Whiteside had exactly one more first team vote than did Damian Lillard. So Hassan Whiteside actually did get a single first team vote if you're looking at the bottom there in the honorable mentions. Yeah, so so he definitely, you know, he got 24 total points, but it see here Andre Drummond got 173. Huge uh, to- dis- huge disparity obviously. Yeah, so it it looks like Hassan Whiteside wasn't even really considered that much by anybody who is voting to be on any of these top three teams. So that's really interesting the way that this, this, the sinners break down for the all NBA team. For sure. And I wonder, uh, I don't purport myself to be like an NBA insider necessarily. Right. I'm not like flying to the games and talking to the players and schmoozing with the owners. So I'm not going to pretend to be one of those guys, but I do wonder about the political, aspect of these kinds of votings where Hassan Whiteside has been in the league for I think three or four years, but really he's only been, he's only really been active for the last two with Miami. He was drafted, I believe by the Sacramento Kings, spent a couple years there, went to the D league, went overseas back to D league and now he's in the league again. But I wonder when you look at, and I hope this isn't too much of a hot take. And if so, I'll grab my oven mitts. But if you look at someone like Hassan Whiteside talent wise, and I know they listed LaMarcus Aldridge as a forward, but I wonder if this isn't kind of like a, you know, uh, not just for this year, but kind of what you've done over your entire career. LaMarcus Aldridge has been incredibly consistent, you know, multiple all-star. Um, and now he's obviously with the San Antonio Spurs, one of the most successful franchises in NBA history. And Hassan Whiteside, you know, getting far, far fewer votes than someone like LaMarcus Aldridge. I just wonder if, if, if past history has anything to do with this, if they're not necessarily just looking at this season when they're casting those votes. That could be the case. And, uh, and I'm looking at all 15 of these guys on, on the three All-NBA teams, and the only player who was on a non-playoff team was DeMarcus Cousins uh, of the Sacramento Kings. So everybody else on that list, those were all playoff teams, and the majority of these guys were on teams that are you know we're at the time of the voting projected to go deep in the playoffs, uh, so I think I think that kind of shows that team success is actually a really 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 big factor on the 129 people who actually place these votes. I think you know Lamarcus Aldridge, while he's had an excellent 10 year career that could you know maybe kind of get that. It's a, it's a vote for his past accomplishments, I suppose. Um, I, I suppose you could say that, but you have a guy like Al Horford, you know, who also has a you know ten year career. Um, I believe he's been on as many All NBA teams and All Star teams as Lamarcus. Uh, similar stats uh, in a number of ways. They they contribute to the game in different ways, and you know, def- offensively and defensively, they have a little bit, you know, slightly different styles, but. You know, Al Horford only got 76 total votes to LaMarcus's 103 votes. Uh, you would think that if it were guys, if they were giving this out to guys based on their past accomplishments or if that played a role, I would expect a guy like Al Horford to be getting more votes. I think personally to me, they're looking at guys who are part of uh, good, solid teams uh, and guys who are a huge, you know, part of the reason why their teams are successful. Yeah. And I I think that is a completely fair argument. Uh, And I think that that might explain why one of my biggest surprises on this list, um, definitely Damian Lillard making second team was great. I probably had him third team, but as far as snubs are concerned, talk about James Harden uh, was the first runner up in this. He received 106 votes, Um, It is interesting because, again, because you have to slot it by position, his 106 votes were not worth as much as LaMarcus Aldridge's 103 votes uh, simply because LaMarcus Aldridge plays forward and James Harden plays guard. But I do think that what you're talking about, someone 
who is with a team that is successful, but also is contributing to that team's success, I think does play into the voting uh, of those media members who are who are casting these ballots. And I mean, you look at someone like James Harden, there's no question in my mind that James Harden is one of the most talented players in the league, hands down. I don't think that's an argument. I think where you start getting into the into the the murkiness a little bit is you look at a Houston Rockets team that made the Western Conference Finals last year and was largely unchanged this year and barely made the eighth seed in a drastically weaker uh, bottom half of the West as compared to last year. Um, there have been reports coming out uh, for a long time about his leadership. You know, people like Dwight Howard kind of disgruntled with his leadership. You had the reports about James Harden taking a separate uh, bus to those playoff games this year. He wasn't with his team. And so I wonder, you know, it's not necessarily just about how good that player is, but how much they contribute to their team's success. Um, and you could maybe make the same argument for why Damian Lillard was held a little higher in these folks' minds than than maybe I would have had him uh, when I first started thinking about it. So there's only six guard slots among these three teams. Uh, Steph Curry, Russ Westbrook, they're not going anywhere. Uh, Chris Paul, not going anywhere on this list. So really, if you're looking for where, you know, where you would be able to fit James Harden in this list, you're probably looking at the three guards, uh, Damian Lillard, Clay Thompson, Kyle Lowry. You're probably going to have to remove one of those guys from the list uh, to get room for James Harden on there because I don't see Paul Curry or Westbrook coming off that list. Now, it, it's kind of interesting to me because you know Damian Lillard making that second team, that was a huge jump. That's probably unexpected for a lot of people. I think, from a national perspective, maybe you know it, it's hard for me to see any of these six guards on the list coming off the list in favor of James Harden based on you know what they did as individuals and all things equal where their teams went compared to the Rockets because the Rockets were on this downward trajectory uh, for the second half of the season and they barely backed into the playoffs and you saw what happened. Uh, in the first round there. So, you know, James Harden, he creates opportunities for his teammates. You know, anybody who plays on that team and is a serviceable corner three-point shooter, if they come to the Rockets, they're going to be uh, a great corner three-point. They're going to get a lot of opportunities and they're going to get a lot of open opportunities based on the way that opposing defenses collapse on James Harden. Uh, and he kicks it out and he does get a lot of assists. So uh, he, he creates a lot of opportunities for his teammates. But if, if you're looking at the way that Clay Thompson, Damian Lillard, and Kyle Lowry affect their teams, I'm not sure that James Harden makes his teams better or his teammates better uh, the way that those three players do. I think, I think that's perfectly fair. And on the other side of the coin, you have James Harden. His team did make the playoffs. So you, I mean, the, the argument that, you know, like you said, there's only one player on the all NBA team whose team did not make the playoffs. That's DeMarcus Cousins, Sacramento Kings. So his team made the playoffs and you look at what James Harden did this year, career high points per game, career high rebounds per game, career high assists per game. And James Harden, this is the same James Harden that was an MVP candidate last year. I mean, there were some people who thought he should have been the MVP. In fact, when they held the vote, uh, among NBA players who they thought the MVP should be, they picked James Harden. I just think that that is interesting. It's bonkers, and, and we'll move on from this topic, but I think the last point uh, I would make about that is is last season, or I should say 2014, 2015, James Harden uh, clearly picked up the defense uh, to a level where it was uh, demonstrative you know, to anybody who was watching. And this season, you saw a clear regression uh, on that defense. So I think, you know, that MVP conversation last season was when he was he was an all-around better player and he was all around lifting his team to another level. Now this year, you saw the way they kind of imploded toward the end of the season, uh, the way his defense completely fell off a cliff. Uh, so yeah, those, those are awesome career high stats. Uh, but if you're not helping your team win, I think, I think this is why he was kind of left off that list. I think that's fair, and you're right. We should definitely move on. We're going to move on to a question uh, about free agency. This question uh, actually came from a couple different people. It comes from 
at Super SET Greg and at Dwayne Peterson on Twitter. Um, Greg asks, why is Philly giving up on Jaleel Okafor so quickly? And then Dwayne asks, uh, with Okafor potentially available, would Portland have anything to offer outside of CJ McCollum? And Dwayne says, personally, he would not give up CJ McCollum. So I guess, Chris, the question to you would be, uh, Jaleel Okafor, Philadelphia 76ers, offensive-minded, big. Um, do you see him as a fit on this Blazers team if he were available? I mean, yeah, anytime you look at a guy who is the number three overall pick who may be disappointed a little bit in his first year uh, in, in a few ways, that to me screams the kind of a guy that Blazers GM Neil O'Shea would go after, you know, kind of a guy who who was in the high lottery and ended up dis- disappointing a little bit that that's certainly a reclamation project quote unquote that that you know O'Shea would be apt to take on I know it's only a year's worth of uh you know evidence here on on Jaleel Okafor so to call him a reclamation project in his second year is probably a bit hyperbole but I I believe he may be. He may have disappointed fans in Philadelphia a little bit, just by not, uh, you know, on the defensive end, not being as impressive as they'd hope. You know, considering the physical tools that he has, I, I think you kind of look at a guy like that and and you just wonder, wow, if he were really able to put it together, what kind of a force that guy would be. You know, if he paired that offensive talent that he has with with. You know some work on the defensive end. You know, I I think that would be the kind of player that they were looking to get with that number three pick. Yeah, I think I, I that that's a good point. And just to a quick point counterpoint, uh, you look at your little Okafor. He's twenty years old, very very young. Bigs generally take a little bit of time to develop, and at any rate, any NBA player is going to take a little bit of time to develop. But uh, when they're twenty, particularly on, de- on the defensive end, and also he does average over a block a game which is not great by any stretch, um, but is serviceable uh, if you're just looking at that stat. But then on the other hand, you have his defensive rating is terrible. There have been tons of pieces. I can't think of anything, any of them off the top of my head that have evaluated how much worse the Philadelphia 76ers are on defense when he is on the floor. So when you're that much of a defensive liability, it is very difficult, uh, very difficult to, to be able to trot your lineup out with someone who's essentially a sieve on the defensive end. And especially when you're thinking about this Blazers team, it seems to me that's kind of the last kind of player that you really need. You have plenty of scoring. I don't think that you need any more scoring. And so to have a big that can't play defense, it seems like that's kind of not what the Blazers have in mind for this offseason, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it it does seem counterintuitive to me to bring in an offensive-minded big when you're looking at uh, Ed Davis and Plumlee being under contract next season, and then Vonley and then Myers Leonard's uh, restricted free agency status, the amalgamation of talent that's currently in, Por- in the Portland front court would suggest to me that they need a rim protector. And, and if you're bringing in Jaleel Okafor, you're kind of bringing in the opposite of that. And that actually that would signify that a guy like Myers Leonard's probably gone because I don't think uh, you're going to re-sign uh, him for the money that he's probably going to get and create a log jam in that in that front court of guys who are really worthy of minutes and need minutes to develop. I mean, if you're looking at Leonard and and Okafor, those guys are both you know would need minutes. Uh, Ed Davis and Plumlee are both whether or not they're starting are going to be worth minutes too. So I just think that would create a crazy minutes crunch. It wouldn't solve uh, the issues that they have. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, it, it would create an issue there because they wouldn't be able to bring in a big without getting rid of one of the other bigs. Yep. I think that pretty much sums it up. Okafor may not be the best fit for this Portland Trailblazers team. So let's move on to a different question. Uh, this one comes from David Agronoff, so at D Agronoff author on Twitter. Um, he has a question similar to someone else. He asks, uh, he's a Blazers fan in San Diego. He said that the team worked out in San Diego last year. What should their focus be this time during the offseason? We also got a similar question from Corinne Fletcher, who happens to be my fiance, so my future wife. Uh, Shout who- out. Shout out, who's an awesome person, a huge Blazers Edge fan. She asks uh, that she's heard rumblings about the Blazers staying in town over the summer to train. How much do we know about that? 
what do we think will happen? And kind of a fun question, uh, where do we think the play, the players are going to hang out between those practices and training? So I think kind of the, the gist of this question, the heart of it is if you have a team that is working together during the offseason, particularly if they stay in Portland, do you think that that means anything? Do you think that signals anything about this team? Do you think that can be beneficial? Um, Chris, what do you what do you think about that? So what what were we touting all season uh, that that was most important to this team, or at least once they kind of turned the corner on this year and, and started performing above expectations? I think it was the chemistry that most fans and most uh, analysts were pretty much touting about this team. I think you know. Um, Mike Barrett and Mike Rice on the TV broadcast. I think this was something that they talked about, and and you heard that San Diego trip brought up over and over and over. And, I, and, and I'm not, I don't, I don't mean that uh, you know in a negative way. I think it is 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 something that if if you see a team doing those kind of things, fans want to hear about it. So so there's nothing wrong with bringing it up, and I think it it kind of speaks to the chemistry that this team had, and you saw them go way above expectations. Uh, everybody seemed to support Damian Lillard in his leadership role. He seemed to be very comfortable in his leadership role. And it, he seemed to be uh, on the same page as Neil O'Shea in the front office and Terry Stotts on the coaching staff. I, I think that chemistry is huge. So staying in Portland, I think, is really big. Uh, you know, If the majority of these guys stick around, playing uh, you know, pick up together, working out together, hanging out together this off season that can only improve the chemistry of this team this off season, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely high on this move too, for sure. I like that they're staying, not all of them, but many of the players are staying in Portland. And you had players like Ed Davis brings up a good point. You know, Ed Davis didn't suffer through all this cold and wind and wet during the winter just to leave right when it gets beautiful. <laughs> if you don't know, Portland is absolutely gorgeous during the summer. Um, so I'm definitely stoked about this move. I wouldn't be surprised if they did take a team trip to somewhere other than Portland, similar how they did in San Diego last year, just to kind of, you know, change scenery and just, you know, straight up relax. Um, but if I'm thinking about going to Corinne's question, if I'm thinking about players, where are they going to hang out? I mean, players like good food. And I know that Myers Leonard is a fan of the finer culinary arts. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some of these, these folks hanging out at places like screen door or pork. No, that's somewhere where Myers Leonard has said he likes to go. But Chris, like if you were, let's, let's just pretend that Chris Lucia is now making his living as an advisor to NBA players, a concierge of sorts, introducing players to the city where they're already playing. Where would you recommend these guys hang out during the summertime in Portland? So I'm, I'm really into, you know, LeBron James a few summers ago when he lost all that weight. Uh, I believe that was before the 2014-2015 season. He uh, was on, I believe it was a similar diet to Steve Nash, that Steve Nash got you know veteran players like Shaquille O'Neal, uh, probably not Shaq actually, um, but uh, Grant Hill, um, guys who extended their career in Phoenix. Not It wasn't only because of that training staff, but some of them adopted the diet that Steve Nash had of uh, no sugar, uh, high fats, low carbs, uh, and again, that was the the diet that LeBron lost all that weight on. From my perspective, I'm going to say something like the cultured caveman. Uh, I want to see the guys. Uh, I guess if you don't know, it's it's more or less a paleo style restaurant where they serve all different types of food, but everything is, is paleo friendly. So if you're on a, uh, a diet similar to paleo, you can go in there knowing that you're not going to have to ask to remove a bunch of things off off the list. So, you know, if these guys are trying to get in, in peak performance shape, I think, you know, getting on, you know, uh, a diet like this, or, or at least watching your diet, it would be pretty important. So I'm going to go ahead and say cultured caveman, something along those lines, uh, something that is is really, uh, you know, forward thinking with the diet. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing to think about too, is not just what you're eating, you know, the, the two cornerstones to your physical health are both your diet and exercise. And something that CG McCollum said is that he's going to be spending quite a bit of time in the Blazers, uh, practice facility. I believe it's in Tualatin. If I have yeah. that right, that he has, you know, he said he has the keys to it. He's going to roll up there and practice without distraction. Um, it definitely seems like a good bet during the off season. And I just want to pivot away to one last question that we got here on Facebook. And then, 
you know, I'll, I'll kick it back to you. We can wrap it up at that point. But on Facebook, got a question from Jake Wynn, uh, and he asks, uh, in the NBA where the center position has been uh, devalued, should the Blazers offer their max cap room to Hassan Whiteside or perhaps overpay for Bismack Biombo? Um, and do either of these players get the Blazers into the conversation for the Western Conference Finals? So I think the question is, is you know, specifically about Whiteside and Biombo, but also where the center position has been de-emphasized in the NBA. Is that the position that the Blazers should spend their money on? And if so, is that going to get them over the hump? Well, if you're looking at 23-year-old Bismack Biombo and, and soon-to-be 27-year-old Hassan Whiteside, I think committing you know, years to those guys isn't isn't that crazy. Whereas you're looking at committing years to a guy like Dwight Howard, uh, with, with the questions there, I think is is a little more questionable. So I, if you strike out on on some of these more sought after centers, then maybe maybe uh, switch directions a little bit and don't. You know, maybe don't go down the list so far to where you're signing Zaza Pachulia if you strike out on Hassan Whiteside <laughs> and, and and with all due respect to Zaza. Um, you know, I, I think, I think, yeah, I think Whiteside could be a he would be a transformational piece uh, for the Trailblazers if they brought him in. Western Conference Finals. I think they need a little bit more talent in general. I think they have a handful of players who would be great coming off the bench uh, who are in the starting lineup. I think Al Farouk Aminu would be an absolutely insane sixth man uh, if they could uh, get an upgrade on the wing there. That would be great if they could. They would have to bring in another guard for the rotation uh, to back up CJ and Dame because I think they need a third reliable ball handler to initiate the offense and a guy maybe with a little bit of size there in the backcourt who when they're facing a, a team who has a guy like a Sean Livingston where you can put him in there and know that he's not going to get taken advantage of on the defensive end and uh, you know someone who can maintain their own effectiveness on offense when they're face, facing a guy like that. Uh, so it, it would be nice. I, I don't think Whiteside could be the only addition to to shoot these the, this Blazer team into the stratosphere. But I do think, uh, you know, if you look at the way that Robin Lopez performed in the Blazers' defensive system a couple seasons ago, you know, they were top 10 in, in terms of defensive rating. And that was uh, with, in the pick and roll defense, the guards going over the screen, uh, sealing off the perimeter, and the big dropping back uh, and, and protecting the rim and, and more or less giving up the mid-range. So, uh, you know, pick and roll being as important as it is to uh, to NBA teams now, and perimeter shooting be, being as important as it is. You know, having a guy like that who can defend the most teams' bread and butter play effectively, and you know, Hassan Whiteside can do that pretty much as effectively, uh, or if not close to it, as effectively as as these you know th three All NBA team guys that we were talking about earlier, Drummond. Um, DeAndre Jordan and DeMarcus Cousins, you know, Hassan Whiteside in, in terms of defending the pick and roll is just as effective as those guys. That that would be absolutely huge. And I think it would allow you know, the Blazers to not have to worry so much going forward with Dame and CJ being a backcourt pairing and worrying about their defense when you have a guy behind them who can help erase some of their mistakes. Yeah. And, you know, Whiteside, that's, you know, Hassan Whiteside is a player that you and I have talked about on this podcast quite a bit. A player that we haven't talked about too much is Bismack Biombo, whose stock is skyrocketing now in the playoffs. He has had some really big games. He's been averaging double digit rebounds um, during the playoffs. I believe he had that one game. Uh, that real eye popper where he scored uh, or pardon me, where he grabbed 26 boards and had four blocks. Um, and, you know, he's an undersized center. If you're playing him at center, I think he's only six, nine, but he's 23 years old. He's still relatively young. Uh, how would a player like that fit on this Blazers team? I know that you'd have to shuffle some pieces around, but I mean, you're talking a Bismack Biombo is a very different player, uh, both physically and how he plays than a player like Hassan Whiteside. So what would you think about Biombo being a, being a Blazer? So, so the question was with the NBA de-emphasizing 
the position of center or, or part of the question was. And so Bismack Biombo fits that a little more than a guy like, say, Hassan Whiteside does, uh, where Biombo is an excellent help defender. Uh, he can actually do a little bit of switching. You know, you don't ask him to go out on the perimeter to defend a guy, but you know, looking at all these other centers that we've been talking about, all these other elite centers, uh, Biombo is probably uh, better at defending the perimeter when he has to. So going against a stretch big, uh, going against screens, switches, I think there's a little more versatility there that you could have defensively. And I think, you know, he could seamlessly fit into that rotation that Terry Stotts has uh, developed over the last year with uh, Davis and Plumlee. I guess being they're going to be the two pretty much the guaranteed holdovers as of now. We don't know what's going to happen with Myers Leonard. But I think sliding him in there, you don't have to change up the defensive system too much uh, because it's kind of based on using that, that kind of versatility that those guys have as opposed to really relying on them to be rim protectors, whereas bringing in a big like Whiteside would kind of require a retooling of the defense. Yeah, and uh, breaking news, Chris, uh, Blazers Edge is ready to announce that the Cleveland Cavaliers will be in the NBA Finals with about four minutes and 40 seconds left in this game uh, between the Cavaliers and Raptors. Cavs are up 104-83, and our boy Bismack Biombo had a relatively quiet game here, nine rebounds, one block, just four points. Um, LeBron James, Kevin Love, and Kyrie Irving all getting it done, all have more than 20 points. So uh, as of recording, even though the game's not quite yet over, Blazers Edge is ready to officially announce Cleveland Cavaliers going to the finals yet again. LeBron putting his team on his back. He now has uh, he now has some pieces, you know, with uh, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love not being injured and with key additions like uh, Channing Frye. Um, the Cavs are looking like a threat in the finals. I, I wouldn't mind wrapping up this podcast. I we want to keep it relatively short, but what do you think? I mean, we still have this OKC uh, Golden State Warriors series to shake out, but uh, since the Cavaliers will be winning tonight, let's just say, uh, w- where do you put their chances in the finals here against either OKC or Golden State Warriors team? Oh my goodness. Well, th- I mean, this is kind of the, the million dollar question. Uh, I guess that a lot of people have been asking because earlier on, I think how you know how long were we saying that this was basically golden the Golden State Warriors championship to win? Oh man, I mean it was crazy all year. They looked absolutely incredible. Obviously, set the NBA record for wins in a regular season. I thought there's absolutely no question, and uh, it's just weird how everything's shaken out, isn't it? It seemed like a foregone conclusion just a month ago before Steph Curry got hurt. Uh, And then you saw the Warriors look a little more mortal in the second round against the Blazers and now uh, in the conference finals against the Thunder. uh, As of this podcast now, I believe they're down 3-2. So uh, it's definitely been a crazy change of pace. And it's really interesting to look at because... You, you look at two different teams with two different styles coming out of the West, so it's hard to compare how that matchup would work with the Cavs because you don't know who's going and they, and they play such different styles. So I would say this. Any team that has LeBron James as of right now has, has a chance in, in the finals no matter what. You saw last season with Kevin Love being hurt, Kyrie Irving being hurt, uh, Della Vadova playing so many minutes that he pretty much passes out on, on the floor. You know, the the group of players that LeBron James led to the finals last year and not only led them there, but I believe they took the first two games against the, the Warriors. Yeah, and I mean, when we're talking about LeBron James, I mean, six straight trips to the finals, that's insane. And is part of it because he's in the Eastern Conference? Sure. But is part of it because LeBron James is the most dominant player of our generation? No offense to Steph Curry. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's 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 interesting also to see LeBron James, you know, as he's getting a little bit older. And it's bizarre to think that he and I are the same age. Um, we were the same high school class. Um, and it's super weird to think that if only I'd worked a little harder, I could be in the NBA, too. Um, and <laughs> I don't actually think that. But it's it's weird to see, you know, he's not by any stretch in the twilight of his career. In fact, I'd say he's he's right in his prime. But as he gets a little older, he's. He's learning how to 
lead. He's learning how to direct a little bit better. He's learning how to be, you know, where to be positionally a little bit, a little bit better to, to conserve energy and things of that nature when your athleticism starts to slip. Um, but yeah, what LeBron James is doing right now is totally nuts. It's a lot of fun to watch. And I, I definitely do look forward to, to seeing them play in the finals. That's for sure. He, he's absolutely one of those guys who really brings up the level of everybody around him. Like, like we were kind of talking about earlier with the all NBA teams, LeBron James is kind of the poster child for bringing up the level of the play of those around him. And so now going into the finals with uh, a healthy Kevin Love, a healthy Kyrie Irving, his two running mates uh, aside him, you know, Channing Fry stepping up, uh, hitting some outside shots and, and playing a role with them. You know, if, if these guys, if the ancillary players for Cleveland are hitting as well as they mostly have for the majority of these playoffs, and if they're able to adjust the way that they've adjusted from round to round, the way that they have getting to the uh, NBA Finals to this point, I, I, th- I mean, the team that comes out of the West is gonna is gonna be beat up. You know, they, they're going to have gone through a tougher battle. I know that the Raptors were able to take it to six games, but I don't think the series has been uh, as, as physical, uh, let's say, as the Western Conference Finals. I mean, anytime you're going against a guy like Russ Westbrook, it's going to be a physical game. Yeah, and what you've seen out of the West is Oklahoma City Thunder are clicking it precisely the right time. And we're seeing basically the maximized potential of Russell Westbrook, no question about it. You could maybe say the same for Kevin Durant, particularly on defense. But you know what takes up a lot of energy is playing defense. Um, And on the other side, the Warriors... Uh, you know, they never expected to be in this position down 3-1 and now they're down 3-2. But um, I think you're right. I think whoever comes out of the West is going to be mentally and physically exhausted. And whether that plays into how they perform in the finals, you know, I'm not sure. Honestly, I don't know how many days rest they get between when the West is done and when they finally begin the NBA finals. Um or whether, you know, maybe that mental and physical exhaustion will be be good in, in some way, shape, or form that you'll feel more battle-tested, more hardened, more resilient. Uh, that's always possible, too. I mean, both the Warriors and, and Oklahoma City Thunder, neither of them are particularly old teams, right? So I don't think that they need to recover for too long necessarily. So, uh, But at any rate, it's going to be interesting to see to see what happens for sure. I mean, no matter how you split, it's going to be it's going to be a fun finals, I think. They're all they're all pros. They've all been they've all been here before for the most part. Uh, you know the the Thunder, uh, the Durant and Russ have been in the NBA Finals before. You know the history of the Warriors. They won the finals last year. Uh, the Cavs have been in the finals every year. They've had LeBron. I mean these guys. Every team that's going to be in the finals is going to be a battle-tested team, and they're going to be pros. They're all going to bring it. They know what to do. So it's it's going to be, uh, no matter who comes out of the West, it's going to be an absolutely bonkers NBA Finals, and, and it's going to be exciting to watch. Now, just to throw one more fun stat at you, uh, if I'm picking my finals, uh, my finals prediction, I'm going to go with Cleveland, and it's for this reason. Kevin Love is undefeated in his career in the playoffs – so long as they play in the United States. And last I checked, both Oklahoma City and Golden State have their home arenas in the United States, so uh, book it, Cavs and four. Hey, there you go. See, I don't don't make the predictions, but I think that's definitely uh, a compelling argument there, so. (laughs) Do, do Do you actually think, do you actually think that was a compelling argument? Uh, no, I was just being polite. <laughs> but uh, to be to be uh, fair, I was kidding. I hope people I hope people understand that. Uh, I absolutely think they're going to understand that, and I think they're going to understand the fact that we're coming up to the end here. And I, I want to say thank you uh, to all the readers on Twitter and Facebook who hit us up with their questions and gave us plenty to talk about this week. I know that there was you know a lot of buzz about the All NBA teams and free agency this summer, so it was really fun to get those questions. And and thanks again for sending those in. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Who I tried to. Uh, respond to to everyone on Twitter and Facebook who sent in those questions. And please send us questions anytime, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, whether it's on BlazersEdge.com, whether you email us at BlazersEdgePodcast at gmail.com, please hit us up with questions. We would love to hear from you no matter where you're coming from.
And we're all wrapped up with episode 140 of the Blazer's Edge podcast. I'd like to thank you very much for joining us this week. And again, I'd like to thank all the readers who sent in their questions on Twitter and Facebook for us to answer this week. Yeah, we wrapped that one up like a big burrito and definitely want to give a triple shout out to Mason Leonard, a.k.a. Ostopedx superstar listener and reader. Thank you, as always, for your support. And also, as always, our intro and outro beats are brought to you by Odar. You can check out his work at soundcloud.com slash Odar Beats. Be sure to tune in to the Blazer's Edge midweek podcast with Dave Deckard and Dan Meringue. And next weekend, we will be off the air, but the finalists will be joining you for the weekend. That's both uh, Tara and Joe uh, next weekend. So please be sure to check them out. For weekend podcast host Chris Lucia, I am Brandon Goldner. And remember... Never fly your helicopters too close to the building.